you're watching The Property Cast, powered by the award-winning Total Landlord Insurance. And welcome to the latest edition of The Property Cast. My name's Eddie Hooker. I'm the MD of HFIS Group. And usually I am joined by Paul Champlina, who is my uh, partnerships director and founder of Landlord Action. But for those of you looking on video, you'll notice that that next to me is not Paul. Sean, Ombudsman, uh, Head of Redress of the Property Redress Scheme. Um, Sean, welcome. Welcome, Eddie. Yes. What did you do with Paul? Well, I think Paul uh, was out in the rain over the weekend and uh, it's got a little bit poorly for Paul. So mm. uh, um, his voice was completely going. So I said I'll step in and uh, um, be a an inadequate uh, replacement for well him. no not at all you're always always adequate it's actually a pleasure and you've actually uh, come into this podcast which is a special podcast because we are delighted uh, to welcome um, a big hitter in the market uh, Nathan Emerson CEO of Property Mark welcome Nathan welcome gentlemen uh, we are a bit privileged thank you for giving up uh, some of your valuable time to come and talk to us I think it's an honour for me to be here with you guys lovely man so what we're going to be talking about really is property marks perspective uh, on the lettings industry uh, we're going through some of the biggest changes certainly for the next 20 years or so i mean the last big change was 2004 wasn't it really with the, with the housing act but this is we are facing over the next few weeks probably by the time this has gone live we may actually have the latest rental homes bill out there but um I wanted to get a, a, an idea on where Property Mark are, how they're viewing this, these big changes, and then talk a little bit about um, what is Property Mark all about, what, is, what makes a good agent, what makes a bad agent. So we've got about half an hour, um, Nathan. Lovely. Thank you again for coming in. Let's just dive in and let's see uh, where this takes us. You're watching The Property Cast, powered by the award-winning Total Landlord Insurance. We all talk about what is a good agent, yeah? And um, from your perspective, Nathan, uh, all property mark agents are good agents. I'm more interested in, in your view, <clears throat> what makes a bad agent? That's a very, very pertinent question. And I think <laughs> probably for, for people uh, watching and listening in, it, it's a very difficult for them thing for them to actually understand what is a good agent, what is a bad agent, and how do they select a good agent. Well, I think probably from my perspective, there are actually two types of bad agent, if I'm honest with you. There are those that intentionally are disregard um, the laws and regulations, and they will go about whatever they want to go about to mm. achieve a level of business. But I think there are others which actually they genuinely think they are doing the right job yeah yeah um but actually over time have, have actually sort of lost their way a little bit and that's not intentional they end up in short practices um which Na naivety naivety mm. and, and actually mm. dare i say it, it's routine we all have little shortcuts we take in our life and if you don't get stung every time you touch the kettle and you don't get burnt you'll keep touching it and mm. i think gradually the next tranche of people come into that company and they touch the kettle and they don't get burnt and so one day you do get burnt but mm. unfortunately it's it's those people probably that are more at risk the people that set out to do a bad job you will never convince them to change and they have to be dealt with in a different way the reality of organizations like property mark we're there to help those people that actually genuinely want to do a good job to be able to do a job got good job and have the right tools and assistance there to be able to do what they're capable of mm. doing, really. Uh, absolutely. Look, and from my perspective, look, what do I deal with? I deal with complaints at the property um, uh, the property redress scheme. Mm. Uh, ultimately, uh, we're here to try and make sure that, you know, we put right when mistakes have been made. We're, so we're not actually slapping people on the wrists, uh, per se, but we're actually trying to teach them the right way to do it. But what is quite interesting is, that, and, and again, you know, I... I I don't want to come from a jaded point of uh, mm. view because the number of agents that are, I would call rogue or whatever, mm. criminal, I think mm. is the word. Paul likes the word criminal rather than rogue, uh, is very, very small. Those other larger but still significantly small number of people um, unconsciously incompetent, I would call them. They don't even know that they're not 
good. Hmm. So that's another challenge. And then there are people that are uh, kind of in between that. So, for example, you know, if you've got around to complying with the law and joining a, a redress scheme, brilliant. Then not to abide by the decisions is our biggest uh, sin. Um, we'll then kick you off the but, scheme. But what makes it, what, what's a common area you're seeing, Nathan, that makes them a bad agent? Um, I, I think that, that, that can be coming in, in a whole multitude of, yeah. of, of things. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're you're acting on behalf of a client, you you know, from a lettings point of view, you've got 170 odd pieces of legislation to fulfil, um, and it can be as simple as administrational errors, which are, are continuous. It can be mm. as much as not renewing with a with a scheme. It can be not understanding money laundering regulations, knowing your client, terms of business, just very very simple things. Mm. It can be more serious than that, where obviously you're 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 holding effectively a tenant's well-being in your in your hand. And you're not carrying out those prescriptive measures that actually can put put life in danger. Mm. Um, so I think there, are, there can be a myriad of reasons. I understand that. But linked to that question, though, mm. is probably where I'm trying to get to, yeah. is how does a landlord know what a bad agent is? <laughs> well, hopefully they would look for a property mark agent. That would be well, the first, they first badge of that. So several things are happening. We, we on our own site, haven't asked the, asked the expert session um, and, and a whole section on those where you can actually find uh, property mark agents, which they are qualified. They are regulated. We do regulate our members. Um, and obviously, on top of that, um, our members do advertise on their websites and in their windows the property mark logos. And that's, that's probably one of the most visible signs that people can see but in addition to that we are carrying out now quite a large consumer facing campaign we've done that in conjunction with Phil Spencer to to help protect the public really and help to to um, uh, make awareness of yeah. the property mark name and we've got over 1.2 million interactions with the consumer um, since we started that a year ago so that message is part of a multi-year campaign it's almost taking us to the Abtra and Atoll recognition type mm. level. That's where we want to go to. So people know that when they go to a property mark agent, they are protected, they are in safe hands, and we are doing the proactive work to try and help those agents do the right job to the right standard. As Groucho Mark said, I wouldn't be a member of a club that would have me as a member. Absolutely. And one of the things about property mark is that you set high standards. Mm. So that means that you know you can't just kind of like pay your fee and join. Correct. And absolutely right, that shouldn't there should be a barrier to coming in to call yourself a property mark agent, to training and everything else. But you know, for the rest of us, the, the rest of the agents, the startups, the, uh, uh, the, the 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 ones that uh, maybe are very small and they've uh, done it for a number of years, and they they don't have the time to go and do the, the training and I know you've made it more accessible than ever before to do that and there should be no excuse. There's got to be something else, isn't there? So that's where we really kind of, uh, the, the, the regulation of, uh, of agents at the base level because, you know, uh, PRS and the property ombudsman are a base level effectively because every agent has to join. Not every agent joins property market. Absolutely, and, and very often in your case, exactly right, you're dealing with the outcome after an event has happened, rather than actually trying to mitigate it in in the first stance well, and, and stop it Put it happen. into perspective, and you know, and again, another sub question to that is, you know, is the economic crisis and everything else reflecting in the in the market? Because we only questions expelled after questions. <laughs> yeah, we only expect uh, expelled sixty one members last year out of eighteen thousand, but that's still sixty one too many, and uh, that but that was thirty two percent up on the previous mm. year. So are we seeing agents getting worse? I think the market conditions are more challenging for agents. Mm. And I think as, you know, we all know how busy the, the rental sector is at the moment. We all know there's a shortage of stock. We all know people having to work twice as hard to accommodate the volumes of people that are doing. And so I think as a natural byproduct of that, people will slip in various mm. areas. And unfortunately, sometimes those slips can be, be more serious. Um, uh, I think the important thing for me, we, we mentioned Roper, you know, where, where are we with that? And I think the, the whole ethos of Roper is about making sure people are licensed and making sure people are qualified mm. to a certain standard. So the equivalent of going to see your doctor or your financial advisor, you know they're qualified to be able to, to, to offer the advice that they give. We don't have that in place at the moment uh, across the property sector at the moment. And mm. that is concerning when you are dealing 
A, very often with people's biggest assets, uh, and secondly, you're in a position where you are dealing with the welfare sometimes of, of vulnerable consumers there, and you're doing that on behalf of a client. So mm -hmm. um, the, the whole idea of Roper is to protect that and, and certainly raise the professionalism in the standard. Uh, until that comes into place, it, it is membership bodies and professional bodies like us um, which will do, will, will do what we can yeah. do to bring our members up to those standards, ensure that they're doing continual professional development, ensure that they've got the training, and ensure they've got the qualifications. And to make matters easier for people to come into Property Mark, um, we have actually uh, created a, a membership opportunity for people who are seasoned practitioners but maybe haven't done their examinations or are, are concerned they wouldn't pass. We've actually now created an opportunity for them to come in and start that process mm. fairly easily to make it more inclusive, really, yeah. and to get people in. Because I'd rather have people coming in and studying and take them along and give them a time to get themselves qualified um, than I would do just to push them away. And, and so there's very little excuse yeah. for people not to actually step themselves forward and, and support the mm. standards that I think both of us want to, to see yeah. out there. And what, what should a landlord or a tenant, for that matter, let's not forget the renter, mm -hmm. Uh, when they're going into a letting agent because as we know tenants find properties not agents Absolutely. agent just happens to be the conduit what should tenants and landlords be asking there should they just say are you a property mark member or is there anything else that they should be looking for within an agent any quick tips I think first quick tip yes obviously are they a property mark member perfectly yeah. but equally um, and I think Sean you touched on it perfectly well it's also checking that they are actually members of redress schemes. It is a legal yeah. requirement. And as I think we both know, there are those operations that have started up and set up and have never made that 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 leap. So there is no protection there for the mm. consumer. There's no redress there for yeah. the consumer. When it goes wrong. Mm. Absolutely. The next thing they need to look at is have they got client money protection? Yeah. It's a vital thing. It should be on their website. It's a legal mm. requirement. Again, um, there should be a certificate to say that when they pay those deposit monies over, that money is protected. When the money is being sent mm. to the landlord, it is protected. So there is no loss for them, really, should there be an unfortunate incident yeah, right. and, so, and how is the agent holding a landlord's money, the rent? 100%. And you and I have been debating this for weeks, haven't we, over we, we, we do you know it. where your money is going? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, mm. and mm. you know, what the one thing that, that making sure your, member, your, your agent is a member of a recognised CMP scheme, and there are six of them out there, mm. um, you know, will ensure that you've got that protection. If they're not registered re redress scheme, if they've mm. not got client money protection, then most definitely you shouldn't be doing business with them, regardless of whether they've got the property. Yeah. And I can't yeah. stress that enough, yeah. really. Yeah, so it's not just look for the cheapest management fee. Um, I mean, in many cases, a property mark agent may well be the cheapest management fee, but do some due diligence. Yeah, absolutely. You wouldn't go to an accountant, would you, without asking, are they qualified? You wouldn't. Or, and let, let's, nah. let's go back to the very bare basic. Mm. As a landlord, if you're instructing an agent to act on your behalf, you are still ultimately responsible yeah. for your legislative Good requirements mm. and your points. So if you are choosing an agent on the basis of fee, and you often get what you pay for in life, mm. you know, at the end of the day, you still carry the can if it goes wrong. Mm. And, and so, you know, you need to be choosing people you know that are going to represent you and are going to make sure that you are not placing that tenant mm. or yourself in an awkward position. Really. Yeah, absolutely. You're watching The Property Cast, powered by the award-winning Total Landlord Insurance. We mentioned at the beginning the Rented Homes Bill, or which used to be called the Renters Reform Bill, but I think it's been called the, rent the, the Rented Homes Bill. We haven't got time to go through all... 10 points of the initial white paper that came out what what's worrying you from a property mark perspective on what's going to come out in that bill or I do think, you welcome it all do you know what i think firstly let, let, let's be honest we know there are lots of areas of the whole rental process that need support need repairing and need change and so there's never going to be a solution that's correct and Anything that comes out of that, I think there'll be arguments for and, and against. I mean, probably the, the biggest one, and I'll only quickly mention it, which, because I think it has been widely publicised in the news, has been uh, repealing what's called Section 21, yeah. um, which is called a no-fault eviction. So that gives landlords 
um, the comfort that if they have a change in circumstances or if they want to recover the property, they have a route in order to do that um, without necessarily having to go to court and serve what's called a Section 8 agreement. So that Section 21 is being removed, and that's being removed to try and give tenants more surety where they are and to make sure it's not an indiscriminate weapon that, that's used against yeah. the tenant. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us would agree from agencies you know, and seeing landlords, landlords don't want tenants not paying their rent, so they're not going to kick tenants out right. without a justified reason yeah. and I think sometimes what we find is section 21 is used to try and shortcut a lengthy process that would put more properties into court uh, antisocial behaviour would be a prime one and that is a very difficult thing to prove because you know if you get a bad tenant in a property it's upsetting the neighbours uh, at this moment in time you need the police to have been heavily involved you need it to have gone the next stage to actually get anywhere the government have indicated that they are going to resolve this issue they're going to make antisocial behavior an easier thing to deal with they make the benchmark lower um but that still will rely on serving the section eight they're going to make it a two-week notice period but that still will rely on going through the court process and as many of us know it can take six months in some areas Absolutely. in order just to get to court so what happens in that six to eight months mm. you know whereas what a landlord would do at the moment is serve a section 21 the tenant would leave and so the actual reasons why Section 21 are used hasn't necessarily, you know, isn't always apparent. Yeah. But very often, if you've got an antisocial tenant or a tenant that's causing damage, the route of Section 21 would be your normal area. Now you've got a different process that you've got to go to. Mm. Um, and the checks and balances will come out as to whether things have been favoured inside of the tenant as much as the balance that has to be there to protect landlords and and and, and people in those, those vicinities. So, will that mean? Uh, do you think that they will? Um, I don't know if the right, right word is repeal, but repeal the short short hold tenancy. Uh, well, they they are moving on to short tenancies, and so to make uh, more longer term, uh, absolutely, more periodic, uh, yeah. shorter and longer. So absolutely right. So <laughs> yeah, the, the perverse side of this, it technically <laughs> yeah. gives gives somebody yeah. less surety. Um, but no, I mean the whole idea is that that. Um, it is being trying to be rebalanced to give people a sense that they've got a home. Let's mm. let's build the argument around that. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing as all the indication, obviously, with regards to people and pets, and you know mm. the ability to be able to bring pets into a into rented environment. And you've got to have a good reason to withhold permission to do that. Um, and so you know we're talking about regulators and having a specific um, you know ombudsman for the for the rental sector. You know mm. again. Uh, another step forward that they're trying to you know pull things together but the reality is you know you've got letting agents you've got selling agents you've got landlords you've got you know you've got a whole environment yeah, and actually yeah. the cross permutation actually if you're really going to be bold you do it in one complete hit really that's what you do but yeah. but i'm not i'm not going to decry what's been done because i think at the end of the day they're trying to do something and i'd rather something that nothing mm. is never going to be perfect. Yeah. Can I pick up on that point, you know, because you mentioned uh, a, a, an ombudsman for the landlords, mm. and uh, one of the things that, you know, well, I've been deeply involved in this mm. uh, way back when uh, uh, Theresa May uh, decided that uh, landlords needed to... Uh, You're not that old, Sean. Oh, it, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, I'm afraid, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, Four it just seems later. a long time ago. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the time, it was, why are, you know, why are agents, uh, you know, uh, under pressure to join a redress mm. scheme, but the landlords are not, mm. you know, are, uh, and why are there things that, uh, land, you know, agent redress can deal with? Uh, but they can't deal with for other things because, you know, basically agents have different responsibility to the landlord. And one of the things that they were talking about from early days, was, the whole thing's so confusing. The poor consumer doesn't know where, which way to go. So let's go down the route of having a, a single single ombudsman, ombudsman mm. you know, single point of uh, complaint across the whole sector. And they were talking about it even covering the social sector. Um, but they opted out on that on the basis that you know, the industry is far more complex than that, and they weren't going down a kind of a portal, kind of a single gateway. Yeah. Now they've come back and said, oh, well, actually, you know, we, we do like the idea of a single ombudsman for the property, but we also think that the agent redress schemes are doing a good job. So rather than have less ombudsman, they're going to have an, an extra one. What's your view on that? Uh... It's like a club sandwich, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, all feel, it all sounds confused. The, the question is, do you want to be the gherkin? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should landlords be frightened of 
the, the redress. I mean, that's probably what you're getting. Okay, at. they they yeah. should be aware of it, and they should be aware yeah. of their responsibilities. And and mm. you know, there are some very very capable landlords out there that actually take their responsibilities seriously. They do the job, mm. and 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 absolutely fine. There are others out there that obviously they're running full time jobs. They've got families. They've got everything else. They've got a couple of rental houses, and and mm. worrying about 170 pieces of legislation. It, it isn't the priority of their, their their day, but it can have an impact. So um, I think the whole idea of this is trying to raise the standard of what is out there, whether this is the right method, obviously. Yeah. I think with that time will tell that, and I think time is a, is a, is a great observer mm. of that. Um, but you tie that in as well with things like, you know, obviously the number of cases now which will start going to court where you're, you're not using a Section 21. So you've also, on the back of that, you're going to have to see court reforms. We would like a housing court. That's what we've championed mm. um, because that becomes a specialism that deals with it. Everybody knows at the moment, if you are a tenant and you're going to court, you sit there because they will give you further time at the property. Very rarely will you be kicked out straight yeah, away. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 all of that process... If you're dealing with one side of the transaction, I think you have to deal with the other side as well. It has mm. to be robust and it has to be fit for purpose. And, and interestingly there, that must be, I might be overthinking this, but this must be good news for letting agents because if I was a landlord thinking, hang on a minute, I'm self-managing, I don't know the 170 pieces of legislation, which technically if a tenant makes a complaint at me, against me, I'm going to fall foul when Sean gets hold of it. Yeah, I would rather offset that, even though I'm ultimately responsible, as you said earlier, Nate, I'd rather say, hang on a minute, you know, I'm not the expert, can I give it over to a property mark, to agent. A property mark agent, who <laughs> at least I can go back when they mess Correct. it up and say, hang on a minute, Correct. you're the professional. I mean, so it must be good news, I think, for... Well, for the sector, well, really. I, I would it's hope so. Both, I, I, isn't it? I, I think it is, and you know, let's be honest. We're talking about protection, but let, let's swing the other side. At the end of the day, you're providing a service. That's what mm. you're effectively doing. Landlords are are technically a business. They're providing a service mm. to their customer. The customer happens to be what we call a tenant. You know, yeah. and so you are uh, providing. You know, it's customer service at the end of the day. Absolutely, but equally. It, it, you're not there to bend over backwards you know you're there to provide it to a certain level a certain standard and, a, and, a, and an appropriate standard really um, and so long as you're providing that accommodation to that standard mm. and you're legally compliant and you're doing the things that you need to do you should be okay it's making sure that you've got the time and resources to do that and if you haven't got the time and resources yeah. get a professional because yeah. Yeah. as you will know you know the, the fines that come out the other end of it and, and, and the hefty. issues that happen are hefty and it's a false economy to cut corners yeah. because of a slight Agreed. bit of a fee Agreed. difference. Agreed. But interestingly, interestingly, and this moves on to another part of the government's proposal, uh, look, when we started, and when, mm. we're not seriously, we're not that old, uh, but we are, we did, when it. we started, it was all very much paper-based, systems didn't talk to each other. Now the government is saying, well, actually, an all-singing, all-dancing portal mm. Uh, that will connect all the compliance stuff together. Is that going to be a realistic uh, and achievable aim for the government to do? And if so, how do you think that would work? I think it's exciting if they do, and remind me to come back to that point in a moment. Um, I think if they can pull it all together, um, and it is a massive challenge to do that, you're talking a lot of pieces of technology have got to talk, they've got to get the APIs working, um, you're looking at access for multiple parties, you've got tenants to access, you've got you know, uh, landlords to access, you've got agents to access, you've got government agencies to access, so there's, you've got multiple parties with multiple logins and multiple, you know, mm. it, it's like a bowl of spaghetti, and obviously there have been trials on it and there's all sorts of beta testing going on at the moment. I actually think the theory of that's quite exciting and I'll explain why I think that's exciting because a bigger issue is actually not the rental sector, it's actually the sales sector and the length of time it takes transactions to go through and a lot of that is all about communication. That's where the issue, multiplication of people providing identity in three or four occasions, so professionals, solicitors and agents repeating the same work, financial services repeating the same work, whereas actually... My head's you, gone already. If you could I'm have, <laughs> if you could have, I apologise, if you could make it work in the, in the, in the rental sector you know if you then tied that in and maybe 
took land registry as the lead on that really which is the holder of all day deeds and titles left right and center and you could pull the same theory into the into the into the conveyancing process and the, the buying and selling process you could probably have a very very strong argument that would use technology to have to speed the process not hamper the process yeah great a great so I find that yeah. quite exciting it is exciting and you say the devil's in the detail and the government have you know mm. they have started work on this we, we just haven't seen it yet and it's mm. going to be very interesting how it's tested in the market and whether that Practical. You're watching The Property Cast, powered by the award-winning Total Landlord Insurance. I'm asked this all the time. It's to do with the rhetoric in the marketplace. I mean, I'm, I'm looking on uh, Landlord Zone at the moment, actually, and there's even an article on that um, about... Um, government's war on landlords causing havoc in the rental market, mm -hmm. and linked to that is exiting landlords. Now, are your agents, are your members seeing an exodus or is this just part of a natural cycle of landlords retiring properties moving into other parts of the private rented sector or are we actually facing a real crisis that someone needs to do something about this now okay so I think we are definitely seeing that. That's no problem at all. We are seeing landlords exit the sector. Partially, there will be some because of age. Mm. There will be some because of legislation, taxation, uh, capital gains. Um, there's a whole myriad of things. And if you're sat there as a landlord, you've had an awful lot of changes thrown at you in a, in a relatively short period of time. Um, you also watch what's happening in Scotland at the moment, where obviously you've got caps on rent and you've got monitoriums of people being able to leave. Um, and and, you know, for a lot of landlords, they're sat there thinking, I've seen a property probably gone up 20% over the COVID period. Uh, I'm at a certain age. Is this worth the hassle? Yeah. Now, the problem that happens with this, and everybody sits there and says, oh, yes, but the commercial landlords will take over. The institutional landlords broadly will find more properties coming back in the sector. You don't want the lots of the same properties. You don't want lots of two bedroom flats. You, don't, yeah. you need a mixed diverse. You need bungalows. You need houses. You need semis. You need detached. You need. You do need apartments. You need dog kennels. You need lots of different types of accommodation, and a lot of that mix is provided because of accidental landlords or, or, or individual people that maybe inherited a property off their yeah. parents that they've rented it out. Once you lose that, there's no, you know, you're, you're, you're making things more difficult and you're not providing the, the quality of stock that you need out there. So we need a mixed environment. There needs to be more incentives. There needs to be an encouragement there. The one thing we do know is it's not whether or not we maintain the same number of people in the sector. We need more. Yeah. We need more. There aren't enough properties. Mm. You know, we, we see tenants that are in tears. You probably see the outcome, you know, where they are their 13th property and they've been 30th on the list every single time. Absolutely. And, and, and the rent's only one huge. person can get it and they're getting frustrated, yeah. they're getting angry. And that's because it's nobody's fault. There just aren't enough houses out there and there aren't the incentives mm. to do that. And I think incentives is a great way to keep landlords in the market. I think it's a really Let's good point you make there, uh, Nathan, because, you know, if you revert the whole sector to a strategic approach to housing yeah in terms of an institutional investor of course their natural is how do we make the most money out of this so let's build a block with 50 units in it of dog kennel size whereas i, I like that that thought actually that the diversity of the private rented sector because they're humans they're you and me and are, are what you like is not what i like and verse, vice versa you do get that balance and mix of different types of property and i think that's a really important point that we miss that we mustn't just encourage the institutional money we need to encourage the you and i to keep absolutely investing in that sector absolutely yeah, yeah. i think there has to be a recognition that you know yes it hasn't been ideal mm. especially in the last uh, four or five years, where a sector that has come in and basically plugged the gap for inadequacies yeah, on, yeah. in housing policies for uh, for decades, and has plugged that gap has been, as I call it, the Dunkirk kind of little boat syndrome. Okay, and now it's you know their city is not fit for purpose, and they're getting a hammering for it. Mm. But we, you know they've done a great job up to now to plug that gap, mm. and yes, it's been 
you know, there needs to be more done to take the weight off of the shoulders of the individual landlords. There is. And I mean, let's go really brave. Let's be really brave. If we took a strategic thing and we said we want to keep that stock there, really, what are the rules around passing that on to family relatives? Obviously, you've got, you know, your inheritance tax issues, you've got things yeah. like that to bear in mind, you know. But actually, ultimately, if you're seeing that stock sold, <laughs> you know, it doesn't help anybody. Mm. Um, so what's the one thing you would change quickly? What would be the one thing I, I, I Just would... Just to keep landlords in the sector... Oh, definitely. I, I would start looking at uh, offsetting interest again, back against right. So taxation. section twenty four. Absolutely. Yeah. I would. I would. I would address that fairly quickly mm. because at the moment, if you look at it in a weird way, you're almost paying tax on gross. If that makes sense. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and I can't think of any other. I, no, I don't. You do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've heard it there. So that's a really common. That's a lot of commentators are talking about that. Mm. And uh, do you think? That is likely to happen. I mean, if we end up with a Labour government in 18 months' time, I mean, their rhetoric is very anti-landlord. The Conservatives don't have moved away from being pro-landlord, and I don't know if that's a vote winner for the tenant market. Do you think it's likely to happen? Uh so one thing I would say is, uh, obviously, Labour are carrying out their own study at the moment yeah. into the private rental sector, um, and I think people can have a direction of travel that they want to go to, but ultimately, the facts and figures will dictate, you know, if you have not enough stock, you've got to get more stock, and you've yeah. got to encourage people to do it because the state can't build it. Um, you know, build, mm. build to rent's expensive, um, you know, so there isn't the machinery and the mechanism there for them to wave yeah. a wand and create it. So whether they have an attitude or not, that ultimately, you know, it might take longer and there'll be people that are suffering as a result of it and that unfortunately will be the consumer and the public if the policies aren't right there will come a point where they'll have to create the policies yeah. that do the environment yeah. it's whether it takes another 10 years and another 10 years of, of people suffering i'm sure we'll be back here yeah. so a quick plug for you uh nathan and property mark so you've got the uh a property mark one conference coming up at the ovo arena in wembley which is a new venue for you um how excited are you about that? I mean, it's like I've heard it's to be the biggest one yet. It, it is, and we're really excited. Mm. Iconic venue, we thought we'd yeah. do that. Uh, and we've called it Property Mark 1 because it's the first time we've brought all of the disciplines together. Yeah. So for, for listeners, we don't just do lettings. Obviously, we do sales, we do commercial, we do auctions and, and um, uh, an inventory. So we're bringing all of those disciplines together under one roof fantastic it'll be the biggest conference from an industry point of view um, and we're really excited you know we've actually sold out uh, we're oversubscribed oh. with with stand sales I from, hope I can from, stop from, from no no you're banned <laughs> uh, so, so, so we're, we're actually sold out from suppliers wanting to get involved yeah. and, and professional bodies also wanted to be there so that's that's fantastic that's that's brilliant yeah. Yeah. Um, and to be so far ahead of the conference with that completely sold out is great um, ticket sales are, are, are well ahead of where we need is to be. Is it open to non It is open mark. to no members, so it's non-members as well as Good. members. Yeah. We have yeah. done that on purpose. Yeah, um, to encourage more people. Absolutely mm. right, because it will be a great day in its own right. You know, we're addressing AI, we're looking at that in a very serious nature. We're flying people in from America that really know what they're talking about in this environment um, because chat GDBT's come in there. Absolutely. Um, we, we've got some very challenging panels on there and we're we're using people that are really going to pull the meat out of here. You know, we want to we want to get to the bottom where the issues are. We want to hear people's real interpretations of where things are mm. we're gonna we're, we're looking at the whole section we're looking at all of the different areas um it's going to be a mammoth day and we've got some lovely evening entertainment planned Fantastic. as well and where can um, they get tickets uh, they can get tickets on the property mart website to me it's, mm. this is a big event for you and for the industry because by then you'll probably find that there'll be debates about the rental homes bill that will probably be landed at that point. Absolutely right. Yeah. And and we are keeping little bits of the of the conference schedule yeah. to be able to react to that because I think Fantastic. there's some great opportunity for people to vent. There'll be automated voting there and question asking. We're opening it up. We want it to be transparent. We mm. want it to be challenging. Um, and we want it to be an industry first as well. It's the first time I'm looking forward happened, to so it. Nathan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. I mean, we could have... Uh, I say this with everyone, but yes. actually... <laughs> Genuinely mean, the we yeah. could have been here for another two hours, yeah. but yeah. Um, um, your voice would have gone by then. Uh, it, I've got one last question to ask you, which I'm asking all my guests that are mm. coming on. Um, it's 20,000 quid. Thank you, bye. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, have, you can only use that, though. You can't go down the pub yep. with it. Okay. Sorry. Yep. So you've got to use that money to invest in improvements to your own rental property. What would you do? Uh, 
obviously I keep my properties in mint condition. Uh, so <laughs> so you'd be so, down the path. Of <laughs> but no, do you know what I would do? I'd like to take your twenty thousand yes. pound if that's possible. And let's address the fact that we've got a shortage of stock out there. And also, let's be honest, we've also got a shortage of stock sometimes in the least affable areas because obviously of the levels of rent and things like that. So what would I do with that twenty thousand pound? I would take that £20,000. If anybody else out there has got £20,000, here's what you do with it. You take that £20,000, you go to some of the lower cost areas, you buy a property there with that £20,000 as a deposit, and you rent it out to somebody that needs a home. What a great, what a idea. great idea. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd, I'd do it very quickly, because by the time you get home, the uh, the 20000 is only going to be worth uh, 1950 <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Nathan, what an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And Sean, thank you, thank you for stepping in. Yeah. Uh, all of our information is going to be at the bottom of the podcast. But thank you very much for listening. We'll be back next episode with more on The Property Cast. You've been watching The Property Cast, powered by the award-winning Total Landlord Insurance. For more, please visit totallandlordinsurance.co.uk.